Leon Shi by Braden Campbell. It was not the sound of the door opening that roused him from his meditative trance, nor was it the muffled cheers from the stadium below or the sharp clacking of Serene's stiletto boot heels as she approached his hex cage. It was the rumbling of his stomach. He chastised himself and kept his eyes closed, his back perfectly straight. His hands rested on his knees, palms turned upwards. She had food for him. He could smell it. A stew of some kind. Rich broth. Soft vegetables. A delicious spice he could not place. Greater good. He was hungry. I brought you something special today. Not the usual fare. Even through the translator device, her voice was the essence of cordiality. No. He would not break down. Not now. He remained perfectly still and focused on his breathing. With each exhalation, he knew rescue was one second closer. Someone would come for him soon. Then he could eat. After some moments, she started tapping her foot. Don't you think this has gone on quite long enough? I mean, starving yourself in protest. It's ridiculous. She laughed a little. He gave no reply, made no movement. At his unresponsiveness, the friendliness in her voice bled away. What does this prove? Who gains? You think this somehow impresses me? Inwardly, he smiled at her frustration. Her true self was showing. His passive resistance was finally having an effect. His hope grew. Well, it doesn't. Hunger pains are quite out of fashion. Not even for the groundlings. Now eat up, Aeon Shi. He could hear her clattering as she passed the bowl through the bars of the hex cage. You have a matinee performance shortly. You'll need your strength. At last he opened his eyes. Certain other species in the galaxy would have described her as coldly beautiful, he supposed. Like all Va Sinda, she was tall and lithe. Her skin was like alabaster, with high cheekbones and dark almond-shaped eyes. Her ears were delicate and pointed. She was elaborately costumed in multiple layers of glossy, bladed armour and silken robes. A belt made of entwined barbed wire hugged her slim hips. Her blonde hair fanned out behind her like the plumage of some fantastic bird, and her translator was fashioned as a golden brooch engraved with lascivious silhouettes. Beneath her heavy makeup, her lips were tight, her eyes burned with anger. All pretense of concern had been dropped. At last, he thought, we have come to a place where we can deal plainly with one another. Demands can be tabled. Negotiations can begin. I will no longer kill for the pleasure of your patrons, he said. His voice was low and rough with dehydration. Serene's painted eyebrows arced. Is that so? It is so. Then what will you do? She gave a slight smirk. Bait the clawed fiends. Dance like a solitaire. He refused to be goaded or insulted. I will do nothing, he croaked. You will open the door to this cage, and you will release me. You have no other choice. Serene looked down and shook her head. It seemed a sympathetic gesture, but he knew better. Sympathy was not to be found in the Varsinda. Aeon she, she lamented. How little you know me. He gathered saliva and cleared his throat. His voice regained some of its strength. I know you very well, he said. I know that before you acquired me, you had no independence. You were in servitude and shadow of others. I know that you have since become wealthy because of me, and that I am quite popular with your audiences. Serene's jaw tightened. He took it as a sign of agreement. I also know, he continued, that you dare not kill me, for it would upset said audience members, and in turn cost you not only your fortunes, but quite possibly your life. A conflux of emotions raged inside of her, anger at his insolence, frustration at her inability to find a hole in his logic, fear at the possibility of losing her celebrity status. I'll have my beast masters force feed you, she said with practised haughtiness. Aeon Shi shook his head. Such a thing is incompatible with my physiology. I would choke and die. The corners of her ruby-stained lips twitched. 
Then I'll hang you from a gibbet and charge the people to watch you starve. You have already admitted that even the most lowly patrons would consider that to be poor entertainment. Better a good day in Shadum than a bad review in Komora. She bristled upon hearing the old theatrical axiom, mostly because it was true. Therefore, since I refuse to participate in your shows any longer, and to murder me would bring about your downfall, you have no choice. You must set me free. His argument concluded, and he settled himself once more to wait for her reply. Behind them, the door opened slightly, and the pale, heavily scarred face of Scalban, Serene stage master, peered in. M -m Mistress, he stammered, this is the five m -m minute call. Serene's eyes never left the tower. We may have to hold, she answered over her shoulder. It seems there's a slight problem with the talent. Hold, Scalban gasped. But, but... Serene ignored his protestations and pressed up against the bars of Aeon Shi's cage. You know, no one in this city is irreplaceable, she growled, and you're certainly not the last of a dying race. What's to stop me from simply finding another one like you? M -m Mistress Serene! Scalban had now hobbled into the room to stand behind her, the victim of one homunculi flesh sculptor after another, everything about him was hunched and broken. We can't hold the show. There are no Tao in the Empire who can match my martial prowess, Aeon Shi replied. My background and training make me unique among my people. That's why the Aeon Tao Ratha chose me. Her eyes flicked up. The little blue alien had given her an opening, and with instincts like a panther she seized on it. Chose you for what? M my mistress What were you doing on that frozen, desolate ball they found you on? Serene pressed. Realising that he had let something slip, Aeon she did not reply. But Serene had hit a nerve, and she was determined to tear the truth from him. Were you in exile on a mission of some kind? Mistress! Scalban yelled. Serene turned on him with lightning speed. A knife had appeared in her hand. I said, hold the curtain. But, m m m mistress Scalban looked pained. Sidek is in the house. Her face became frozen. Master of the revels, Sidek. Yes, if we don't begin on time. Serene hushed him with a wave of her manicured hand. As important as it was to keep her customers happy, it was doubly so for Sidek. As a minister of Vect, the ruler of all Kamora, it was his job to superintend each and every gladiatorial game and bloodletting performance. If it were found lacking, say by starting late, he could close her down with a word. A slight change, she said to Scalban. Start the show, but have the Beastmasters parade the spinebacks around the ring first. That will buy a few minutes for you to bring up the other three from storage. But, m m mistress, everyone is expecting to see him. Scalban pointed at Aeon Shi with a bony, elongated finger. And they will, she purred. Now go quickly. Scalban shuffled out with surprising speed. When he was gone, Serene withdrew a small device from her cleavage and turned back to face the hex cage. Aeon, she said slyly. In your language it means priest, yes? It has many facets, that word. Priest being one of them. A more accurate translation might be shepherd. Shepherd, even better. You have a responsibility then to protect your flock from harm. You would lay down your life in order to spare theirs. She pressed her palm against the bars of his cage, muttered something he couldn't quite catch and then stepped back. You are free, she said. Aeon Shi remained perfectly still, sensing a trap. I am free to go? he asked, cautiously. Serene shrugged. Free to go, free to stay. The door will automatically release in one minute, and then we shall see. See what? Serene smiled with wicked delight. Why, see where your loyalties lie. She squeezed her thumb against the side of the small device. The hex cage began to descend through the floor on a lengthening chain. A moment later, 
Aeon Shi found himself high above the darkened arena. The lights were lowered in preparation of the show. Everything was cast in gloom, but Aeon Shi was quite familiar with the space by now. He had, after all, spent most of his time here since his capture. It was like being inside a tall barrel. As he had come to understand it, the architecture was considered classical among the Va Sinda. They called it a playhouse. He knew it to be a killing floor. The main fighting area was covered with white, hard-packed sand, the better to show off the spilled blood and viscera of the performers. From experience, he also knew that there were trap doors hidden underneath, from which trained monsters and automated killing machines would randomly burst. The walls were filled with recessed seats, stacked in multiple levels. The wealthiest patrons sat up atop where they could be seen by everyone in attendance, while those with less to spend had to sit closer to the ground. There was a single large archway, cut into the ground level, through which slaves or monsters entered, and their piecemeal remains could exit. Across from that was the gallery, an open platform decorated with lavish couches and chairs, where Serene would sit and entertain important guests. Directly above that was a proscenium, filled with musicians. He was still descending through the darkened air when the cage jerked to a stop. An announcer's thunderous voice called out his name and lights bathed him. From somewhere out beyond the blinding haze, a crowd cheered. He had not been exaggerating when he had told Serene that her audience loved him. It was true. He was unique, and therefore he supposed of great interest to beings who thought they had seen it all. Moreover, he was on a winning streak. They thrilled to see him pitted against ever more difficult foes, and when he survived to fight another day, their fervour grew. They filled the seats to see if this was the day it all came to an end, and if it wasn't, they were still satiated by the carnage he wrought. Throughout Kamora, he was billed as Ayan Tonush Geise, the fighting blue man. Each battle was expected to be his last, but time and again he walked away. The Vasindar loved him for that, in their own sick fashion. His eyes adjusted quickly, and he looked below to see what they had prepared for him this day. On the sands, a trio of hulking beasts clawed at the dirt and howled in bloodlust. Their backs were covered with long spines. Their eyes were wide, black saucers. Thick metal collars were fixed around their necks, and lengths of barbed chain held them in place. Aeon Shi had seen this many times before. The bottom of his cage would vanish momentarily, and the second his feet touched the ground, the collars would pop off. After that, it was unscripted, impromptu violence. Either he would die for the audience's amusement, or kill for their pleasure. From the orchestra came a complex drumbeat, followed by the shrill bleating of horns. The spotlights twisted around and stabbed their beams down at the large entryway. Its doors had opened, and through it came a flat, hovering platform. A large cube of some kind, draped entirely in purple satin, rested atop it. Four beastmasters, nearly naked save a few strategically placed pieces of armour, escorted it into the centre of the arena. Then, with great pageantry, each of them grabbed a corner of the fabric and pulled. The purple covering came away in equal quarters to reveal a large cage underneath. Aeon Shi started. Inside the cage were three Tau. They were of the earth cast, shorter than he was and broad across the chest. Their hands were large and their limbs were thick with muscles. Their faces were covered in cuts and bruises, and their eyes were wide as they tried to take in the incomprehensible scene around them. Their clothing had degenerated into rags, but he recognised them all the same. They were supposed to have been his rescuers. Arthur's Moloch The world was cold and bleak, a mottled sphere of grey rock and white ice fields. Even the sun and the sky had long ago sloughed off its heat and light until only a brown dwarf remained. Had he not been following in the footsteps of another, he never would have come here. It was a planet that one came to only if one had a specific reason for doing so. Aeon Shi's reason was to better understand Farsight. 
Chasso Viola Chauva, Case Montia, more commonly and simply called Commander Farsight, had been one of the greatest town military minds to ever live. More than two centuries ago, he had led the effort to repulse Guayla invaders from the Imperium of Man. The last of that resistance was routed here, from Arthas Moloch, and the Tau Empire claimed victory. It was a fantastic moment in history, a triumph of the greater good over the uncivilised barbarity of the galaxy. But instead of returning home to bask in well-earned honour and glory, Commander Farsight took a cadre of his closest men and left. He turned his back on everything he had fought to protect, headed out beyond the Damocles Gulf and established his own enclave, peopled entirely by members of the Firecast. He who had so valiantly upheld the Tovar in battle had in his final act completely undermined it. The loss of so beloved a figurehead and the unanswered mystery of why he had turned renegade whittled away at Tau society in the years that followed. Many wondered whose example was to be followed. The ethereals who taught that individuality pales in comparison to the needs of the greater whole, or Farsight, whose final message to the Empire was that its people should seek their own paths. At last, the situation had become untenable. Farsight's influence was more widespread than ever, despite his absence, and so the Tau leadership decided to repatriate this wayward general to bring him back into the fold, and by doing so, unite a fractured and divided people. Someone would have to travel out beyond the security of the Empire, find Commander Farsight, and extend the hand of brotherhood. That person was Aeon Shi. Aeon Shi had spent his life in an obsessive struggle to understand others. He had immersed himself in the specialities of the Tau castes. He had studied in depth every alien species the Empire had come into contact with. Now he had to understand Farsight. Aeon Shi was determined to go where he had gone, to experience what he had experienced. Only then could they deal plainly with one another. So we had come to Arthas Moloch. The Tau leadership had forced upon Aeon Shi everything they thought he might need. He left the Empire with a starship full of weapons, diplomats and equipment, a bodyguard of highly decorated fire warriors and even a young ethereal to act as his adjutant. The moment his shuttle touched down on the planet's surface, however, he told them all to go home. This, he said, was a journey for himself alone. Even though they were aghast, everyone complied, save for his bodyguards who claimed that their oath to protect him couldn't be broken under any circumstances. He nodded, instructed them to guard his ship, and left them standing ankle-deep in the snow. He walked a short distance to Colony 23, a town established by the Earth, Water and Aircast members Farsight had left behind, 232 years previous. This was a town on the very edge of Tau space, far removed from the regimented, civilised heart of the Empire. Everything had a makeshift frontier feel to it. The spaceport, as such it could be called, was nothing more than a large field with a single control tower and communications dish. The streets were wide but unpaved, the buildings were low and round and obviously prefabricated. Eon Shi liked the place immediately. The Hall of Records, when he found it, turned out to be the cargo container from an interstellar transport. It had been converted into a three-storey building. The exterior still bore the markings of Farsight's final expedition, faded to near illegibility. Inside, a trio of water-cast tau, older even than he, were more than happy to regale him with tales of the past. The commander had gone west, they said, a day's journey or so to a nearby ice field. There, at the bottom of a canyon, he found a cluster of ancient alien ruins. Exactly what happened next wasn't recorded, but the aftermath certainly was. Farsight returned from the ruins, gathered up only the firecast, boarded the vessel that had brought everyone here, and left. Alien ruins, Aeon Shi mused, as he sipped a cup of warm fish juice offered him by one of the scholars. Of what origin? That is difficult to say, came the reply. Arthur's Moloch is covered with many such sites, 
and not all of them built at the same time or by the same species. The ones in the northern reaches, for example, are frighteningly huge in scale, and square, blocky, and many millions of years old. Others are twisted and crumbling heaps of stone. A few are smooth and aesthetically pleasing, and so pristine they might as well have been built yesterday. There are even structures on the moon. Arthur's Moloch has apparently been something of a galactic crossroads for many untold ages. If that is where Farsight went, Aeon Shi told them, then that is where I must go next. One of the archivists laughed lightly. That will make Geron happy. I'm sorry, who? Fyuva Geron. Overseer of alien buildings? Aeon Shi repeated. It was a title he'd never once come across. A name he gives himself, another of the record keepers said. Garon is of the Earth cast. He fancies himself a master of xenothropology and a student of alien architecture. He spends nearly all of his time camped out on one site or another. Only returns here to twenty-three a few times a year, the third archivist said. He was blind in one eye and had lost most of his teeth. Gathers supplies, has some equipment prepared, finds a few apprentices foolish and young enough to join him, and then goes back out into the wild. And why should my arrival make him happy? Aeon Shi asked. All three of the water cast, Tao, laughed. Because, said the toothless one, he'll finally have someone to talk to who hasn't heard all his stories. The next morning, Aeon Chi procured a transport and sped off across the frozen wastes. The feeble sun was setting as he approached the excavation site. He stopped the skimmer just outside the perimeter of the archaeologist's camp, gathered his pack and began to walk. The fabric of his travelling robes retained most of his body heat, but even so he hunched his shoulders against the increasing wind. Tiny ice crystals stung his eyes. Dark and threatening shapes began to loom around him. The tower buildings were tiny, cream-coloured domes, huddled against enormous, curving alien structures and vertical glacier walls. He stopped when he noted someone loping towards him. It was a tower, presumably of the earth cast, whose stoutness was comically exaggerated by the thick layers of thermal clothing he wore. He carried a portable glow globe that bathed everything in the immediate area, in pale yellow hues. Eun Chi raised his right hand in formal greeting. Taumanat! he shouted over the wind. Taumanatla! the other replied. He ran within arm's length and then stopped panting heavily. He wore a wide and excited grin and looked around with childlike expectation. You've come at last. Where are the spare parts? he asked. Eun Chi shook his head. I'm not here to deliver anything, if that's what you think. You're not? The young Tao's face fell. Did not one at uh, Colony 23 inform you that I was coming? The esteemed gentleman in the Hall of Records, perhaps? The youth shook his head. We have no communications array. The overseer says that isolation sharpens one's observation skills. We requested additional equipment some time ago, and when the perimeter sensors picked up your vehicle, I assumed... He trailed off in bitter disappointment. Then he frowned. Who are you, then? For a moment, Aeon Shi considered lying. Whenever other Tao knew there was an ethereal in their midst, they felt compelled to put on great shows of hospitality and compliance. All he wanted was to be left alone to explore these ruins and delve into Farsight's mind. My name is Aeon Shi. He sighed at last. Personal preferences, he reminded himself, rarely served the greater good. The apprentice's eyes grew wide and he bowed deeply. Aeon, he breathed. It is an honour to receive you, unworthy as I am. Perhaps we could go inside. Certainly. The young Tao stretched out his arms and waited. Aeon Shi sighed again, then shrugged off his pack and gave it to the apprentice. Together, they walked through the gathering dusk towards the nearest building. What shall I call you? Aeon Shi asked. I have yet to choose a name, Aeon. Well, you are only at the beginning of your life's journey. 
he and she said, as paternally as he could. There will yet be time. Avisir Garon has in the meantime christened me as Viola Chala. You may call me that if it pleases you. Eon she thought the name spoke more about the one who had given it than the one who bore it. Chala literally meant action creature, or in the tongue of other species, go-to man. They came in out of the wind and cold into a dome-shaped room filled with crates and equipment. Enough space had been cleared to accommodate two computer workstations. A connective tunnel led off into Spartan sleeping quarters. A ceiling-mounted heating unit struggled to make the room tolerable. Huddled over one of the workstations was a burly earth-cast tau. A black visor covered his eyes. Cables ran from it to a glove on his right hand. He made a flicking motion in the air, leafing through a stack of papers that only he could see. Did that courier bring us a new baryonic imaging scanner, Chyla? he said absently. Regrettably, no, Aon Shi replied. At the sound of the unfamiliar voice, the visored Tao looked up. And why not? Because I am not a courier. Garon removed his visor and let it clatter to the desk. He glowered at Chala for letting an apparent stranger waltz into his research site, then demanded, Well, who are you then? Aonchi bowed his head. Even though he himself was of a far higher social standing, he was a visitor here. It was right for him to show deference to the head of the household. I am Aonel Viorala Shi. Guran's face went slack for a moment before he charged around his desk to greet Aon Shi. In his haste, he forgot to remove his interface glove and the visor, still attached, and dragged across his workstation. Pieces of white stone and electronic scraps scattered across the floor. It is a great honour, he gasped. A great honour. I am Fior Gurun. Welcome, Aonla, to my humble research outpost. Aon Shi, please. The overseer paused at the invitation to address one so high above him as a familiar. As you prefer, he said slowly. To what do we owe the visit? Again, Aon Shi hesitated, wondering exactly how he should answer. His assignment to find and repatriate Commander Farsight was not technically a secret, but neither did he want the whole Empire to be aware of it. There was a very real possibility that it would come to naught, and he hated to raise up the people's hopes only to dash them further. I am on a fact-finding mission, he said carefully. My search for insight has apparently led me here. Garon's face lit up, just as the three old archivists had predicted it would. If it's facts that you seek, then I would be only too happy to provide them. He began pulling at the fingers of his interface glove. Chala here will prepare a meal while I take you on a tour. You will doubtless wish to see the structures I have excavated first hand. Before anyone could even reply, Garon had grabbed a heavy coat from next to the door and charged off into the Arctic night. Chala smiled weakly, bobbed his head and excused himself. And she took a deep breath and went back outside. I have been told, Garon, and she said as he jogged to catch up to the rotund scientist, that this planet has played host to a wide and varied number of alien species over the centuries. Garon gave a look of pleasant surprise. He sealed up his coat and pulled a pair of thermal gloves from out of the pockets. The Aeon has been told correctly. Arthas Moloch contains ruins from at least twelve different races. It seems everyone stopped here to visit at one time or another. Most fortuitous. How so? The sun had vanished now, and the two of them walked beside a string of tiny glow globes. The lighted path led them from the habitat domes and down beneath the glacier. The biting wind was stifled. Well, Garon answered, we get to study the peoples of the galaxy without leaving the comfort of the Empire. Perhaps the Aeon is aware that I have spent half my life on this world, fifteen local years. Now I put names to several of this world's visitors. They came around a corner and entered a spacious chamber, hollowed out of the ice. Large glow globes made it as bright as noon. In the middle of the space sat an ornate machine, 
crowned with sensors and blinking lights. Part of its side had been pulled away, and an earth-cast tau sat before it, prodding it with tools. Aonchi was more taken with what lay beyond, however. The wall of ice was not a typical pale blue or white. It was red, from top to bottom. It seemed as if the glacier had been coated with melted crimson wax. Jutting out from this was a strange, curving structure, the colour of pale bone. A large platform, made of the same material, emerged at the bottom. The immediate impression was that he had stumbled across the rent flesh and exposed rib of some ancient and titanic beast. Geron noted Aonchi's shock. Ah, yes, he chuckled. The blood wall can be disturbing when first seen. Aonchi licked his chapped lips and recovered himself. The blood wall. That's what Charla called it when we first discovered it. The name has regrettably stuck, even with me. Although it appears the ice is made of frozen blood, I can assure the Aeon that it is not. The discoloration is natural and actually caused by iron oxides and hypersaline water flow. He crossed his arms and looked quite pleased with himself. Aeon she was unable to shake a sudden and powerful sense of foreboding. He gestured up at the alien structure that emerged from the ice. Natural or not, who would choose such a site to build? The original occupants left few records behind. This archway and several other similar buildings formed an outpost of sorts, I think. You think? And she knew, as soon as he spoke, that his voice carried too much of an edge. Garon shrank back slightly. It's a guess, Aeon, but a very educated one, I assure you. Core samples taken from the surrounding ice indicate they abandoned this place more than 35,000 local years ago. Over time, this chamber froze solid, but I've been using coherent particle beams to melt the ice and map the internal circuitry of the arch. In fact, Geron frowned, we should be doing so now. Please excuse me, Aeon. Geron stormed off towards the machine and began a hushed but furious conversation with the other Earthcast Tau. Aeon Chi followed behind slowly. Perhaps it was the stifled atmosphere inside the ice chamber, or the disturbing wall of blood, but he felt as if he were moving through a dream. He craned his neck and looked up at the arch. The surface wasn't smooth, he saw, but finely pitted. It wasn't just the colour of bone. It was bone, or something very much like it. There were species in the galaxy that utilised such biotechnology he knew. People's ancient and unknowable. Contact between them and the Tau was infrequent, to say the least. But Aeon Shi had spent a lifetime in study. His brain was filled to bursting with obscure reports and references. Garun was still interrogating his fellow scientist. Bentu, you are supposed to be running a spectrographic scan of the crystal embedded in the platform section, he hissed. Why is this not being done? Can't you see we have an important visitor? The seated Tau struggled to his feet. His environment suit was rimmed with frost that flaked off as he bowed. Forgive me, Fiova. I was performing the scan. Everything was going well, then the feedback pulse hit. Feedback? What feedback? I don't know. An energy signature from the arch itself. It overloaded the scanner, and I've been trying to repair it ever since. Why didn't you inform me of this earlier? You said not to bother you unless it was important. The light from the glow globes dipped for a moment. What was that? Garon sounded more annoyed than concerned. Bentu seemed embarrassed. There have also been increasing power drains. I don't know why. Garon, Aeon Shi said. This archway, this entire structure, was completely encased in ice until you began thawing it. Yes, Aeon. So all of this was inaccessible during Farsight's time? Farsight? Garun gaped. Well, uh, yes, completely cut off. If you'd like to visit the surface ruins, the same as he would have, I'd be only too happy to... The glow globes went out again, and this time they did not return. For a moment, the only illumination came from the blinking error message on the scanner's display screen. Then the blood wall seemed to radiate a flickering blue light that turned everything in the ice chamber a sickly purple. The three of them turned just in time to see a swirling vortex of energy appear. 
It stretched from the apex of the bone arch down to the flat platform and looked like a pool of quicksilver turned on its side. Creatures were now standing on the platform. Eonshi did not know how it was possible, but they had simply appeared. They were silhouetted by the flowing energy field behind them. Four of them looked like oversized canines, whose skin had been removed. The other three were whip-thin, bipedal humanoids. In their hands were held a variety of nets and barbed spears. What clothing they wore was skin-tight and adorned with blades and spikes. A flock of bird-like creatures broke through the silver pool, making sounds like screaming babies. They circled around the top of the chamber, pecking at one another. Aunchi had dedicated entire decades to the study of the races that dwelt in the dark places out beyond the Empire. These had to be the Va Sindar, the dark raiding ones, piratical monsters who struck from the shadows, took what they wanted and vanished back from whence they came. To his knowledge, they had never been seen in Tau space until now. The hounds snarled as the three lanky figures surveyed their surroundings and noticed the Tau simultaneously. They said something in their native language and smiled wickedly. Aonchi shrugged off his thermal robe and walked a few steps forward. From his belt, he unclipped a heavy cylinder. With a flick of his wrist, it telescoped outwards from either end, forming a long, bladed staff. He twirled it like a windmill, and then spread his arms wide. Over his shoulder, he called out to Garon, Take my skimmer! You and your men get back to Colony 23. Tell them what's happened. What about you? Garon cried. And she squared his shoulders. I'll be fine, he said, more to himself than reply. Garun and Bentu scrambled back towards the tunnel entrance. Two of the Var Sindar moved as if to go after them, but Aon Shi matched their steps. He shook his head, sure that his posture spoke clearly across any cultural gulf. At some unspoken command, the skinless hounds charged forwards. Aon Shi flipped himself backwards to land on top of the bulky scanning machine, where he couldn't be surrounded. The monsters yelped and swiped at him. He beat their claws away with his staff. They tried to leap at him. Again, he stopped them from so much as touching him. His weapon was a blur, moving left and right, blocking and sweeping. One of them launched towards him, its jaws gaping. Aonshi stepped back, swung his staff in a wide arc and decapitated it. The remaining three beasts paused to re-evaluate their target. He let them regroup and jump down putting the scanner between himself and the monsters. One of the Va Sindar made a piercing whistle, and the flock of birds responded. They rocketed towards the tunnel, intent on catching up with Garon. Eonshi hurled his staff at them like a javelin, then broke into a sprint. The blade pierced one of the birds clean through and dropped into Eonshi's waiting hand. The rest raced back up to the ceiling, crying in protest. The grins had vanished from the faces of the Va Sindar. Instead, they looked perplexed. The one standing in the middle barked out an order, and the other two charged forwards. The hounds and birds did likewise. I'll be fine, Eon Shi reminded himself. They hit him all at once, with an avalanche of claws, beaks and blades. Nothing could find purchase. Eon Shi gripped his staff loosely, tucking it in close to stop a spear. Sweeping it high to strike a bird, jabbing it straight forwards to knock a hound away. He was in the eye of a storm of violence. Their inability to hit him, let alone hurt him, made the two Va Sindar boil with anger. They screamed obscenities at him. The birds wailed. The hounds roared. Aonchi said nothing. His face was impassive. Even when a serrated blade at last slipped past him and gouged a deep hole in his arm. He stayed silent and focused. There were too many, he realised. He was only holding them off, instead of inflicting casualties. He tried to back up into the tunnel. In the closer confines, he thought, he might be able to focus on killing his foes rather than simply stalling them. One of the hound creatures snapped at his ankle. He reflexively kicked it in the face. His knuckles were scratched and bleeding, torn up by the birds. The wound in his arm began to burn terribly. His vision blurred. The spear, he thought. Something on the spear 
Toxin. Very underhanded. He was nearly to the tunnel when he lost all feeling in his right arm. The agony was spreading across his chest now. His skin felt like it was on fire. He tried to compensate, but his defence crumbled and he dropped to one knee. Something slammed into the side of his face, twisting his head. Blood sprayed from between clenched teeth. The world swam. Then he went down. They kicked him in the spine, and something was chewing on his leg. But these were distant, secondary things. The knife wound consumed his thoughts. He had never felt such agony. The ice did nothing to soothe his skin. After a few moments, he realised dimly that he was still alive. Cold, smooth hands were holding his head, rolling it from side to side. He fought to stay awake. Falanus nin ithin? a voice asked. The words had a disturbing vibrato to them. After a moment, he was slapped across the face. Chethnea, vinea, thinabin, maraj mol quayan? One of his attackers was leaning over him. Aeon Chi focused his vision with all his might and noted pointed ears, pale skin and high cheekbones. I don't, I don't understand you, he muttered. Tayathe, the Var Sindar replied. His fellows laughed at the shared joke. Aeon Chi was dimly aware that they were binding his hands and feet with barbed chains. They felt sharp and cold. Then he was being dragged roughly across the ground. What are you doing? he slurred. Where are you taking me? Aeon Chi managed to lift his head. The archway and the flowing silver portal were looming close. He managed to spit out one final word before the agony of his wounds made speech impossible. Why? The Varsindar leader stooped down over him once more. He patted the wound on Aeon Chi's arm in an almost sympathetic manner. Then he pulled back and punched the tau in the jaw. His last thoughts before he lost consciousness was that he hadn't failed in his duty as an Aeon. He had secured Garon and his men enough time to get away. They would find help in Colony 23, his bodyguards perhaps, and return to save him. All he had to do was wait and stay alive. At the sight of the free Tau, huddled together terrified in their cage, the audience laughed uproariously. The band struck a tune, and the Beastmasters pranced merrily back towards the entryway. Aeon Shi gripped the bars of his hex cage until his knuckles turned white. Garun, Chala, and Bentu hadn't evaded capture after all. They never made it back to Colony 23. No one was coming to save him. His life was over. He looked towards the gallery in despair. Serene was playing the hostess to several other Varsindar nobles, passing out goblets filled with golden wine. She threw back her head and laughed. Then she walked to the front of the platform. She had something in her hand which she raised. The audience quieted down in anticipation. At Serene's signal, the cage containing Garun, Chala and Bentu collapsed. As they ran off the platform, the beasts were freed of their restraints. An excited cheer swept through the house. It was going to be an easy slaughter, and all Aeon Shi could do was watch. No, he realised. He didn't have to just sit up here helplessly. Serene had told him that his hex cage would be unlocked. Free to go or free to stay, she said. He pressed on the bars in front of him. They swung away easily. It would be a simple matter for him to jump down to the sand below, slay the beasts and save his fellows. He could also abstain from performing before the Varsindar, as he had sworn to do, but then he would be knowingly shirking his duty as an ethereal. Sarin had surely known the impossible choice she had presented him with. To either betray himself or his people, but betray something nonetheless. No matter what he did in the next few seconds, he was beaten, either by his actions or his inactions. The crowd's thirst for blood would be satiated. The epiphany took his breath away. Aeon Shi saw that he had come to understand yet another alien species. The Va Sindar were Ko Tao, anti Tao. Their existence was based entirely on selfishness and the misery of others, both physical and emotional. They were the absolute opposite of the greater good, and they had to be stopped. They had to be destroyed. He hit the ground and rolled. There were no weapons in the arena, he noted, 
Apparently, he was supposed to either fight the spinebacks hand-to-hand or improvise. He chose the latter. He grasped a bar from the collapsed cage and swung it round just in time to catch one of the monstrosities in the face. Part of its head caved in, spraying yellow ichor. It gave an ear-piecing cry and whirled. A spike-encrusted tail caught Eon Shi in the thigh, tearing out hunks of blue flesh. He brought the bar down again in a killing blow, but the beast leapt back. Eon Shi! he heard Chala cry. Behind you! The other two monsters, attracted to the scent of his blood, were circling around him. They charged in a loping gait, but Eon Shi was ready. He leapt high into the air and drove the bar through one of their quilled haunches. He let go of his weapon, rolled in the sand, and came up panting. All three of the fiends were still alive. The one with half a skull gibbered horrifically. The crowd seemed delighted. The earth-cast Tau had sheltered underneath the hovering dais, and she scrambled to join them. As the sole uninjured beast charged forwards, it slammed into the side of the platform, causing it to rock violently. The monster spat and hissed, but was too large to reach its targets. What will we do? Garun sputtered. What will we do? I am not sure, and she admitted. He pressed his hands down over his gushing thigh and looked about hastily. I need a weapon. All three spinebacks were now circling the dais, trying to get at the tau. Things had come to a standstill. The audience was getting restless. Does this platform have controls? A and she asked. Yes, Bentu replied. He seemed the most collected of the three. Some pedals and a manoeuvring stick. Aon Shi tore a strip of material from his robe and tied it tightly around his leg. He winced as he kinched it. Can you pilot it, then? Bentu swallowed hard. I can try, but how do we get from under here? The spinebacks growled. One of them was lying on its side, pawing at the town like a cat unable to reach a mouse. Its breath was foul and hot. It was an honour to serve you, Eon, Chala said quietly. Then he bolted out from underneath the dais and sped away across the sand. The spinebacks abandoned their efforts and bounded after him. The audience laughed to see the boy flee and cheered joyously when the monsters pounced on him. They each grabbed a limb and pulled Chala in grotesque tug of war. There were a series of ripping, tearing sounds as his body parts flew off in several directions. Go! Go! Aeon Shi yelled. The Tau dashed out from their hiding place and climbed atop the platform. Pieces of purple material still flowed down off the sides. Aeon Shi and Garon grabbed the bottom of the cage. Bentu took precious seconds to look over the controls and then stomped down on one of the pedals. The machine lurched forwards. A ripple of surprised laughter went through the crowd, followed by a smattering of applause. The dais was barely more than an enlarged floating wagon. It was certainly no escape vehicle, yet the fighting blue man and his little friends acted as if it was their salvation. Delightful. The monsters looked up at the sudden movement and gave chase. In a matter of seconds, they were closing on the tower. Garun screamed at Bentu to go faster. The platform lurched again, tilted wildly, then rocketed forwards. The spinebacks surged to keep pace. Up in the gallery, Serene spoke into the small device in her hand. Scalban, let's give them some obstacles. A moment later, several of the trap doors in the arena floor popped open. Short, flat-topped towers emerged, their bases ringed with blades. From nozzles near their crown, they began to spray thick green tar in long torrents. Aeon Shi had seen these before. They reminded him of the sprinklers used on his arid homeworld to help manicure lawns. Only instead of water, the Varsindar were using corrosive bioacid. Bentu saw the towers appear and veered the dais to one side. The spine back, with only half a head left, caught a full jet of the deadly chemicals. It dissolved into two separate halves that twitched and kicked in circles. The platform levelled out again, and Aeon Shi turned to Garon. Help me flip this, he yelled, indicating the bottom of the cage. Struggling to keep their balance, they dug their hands underneath the heavy frame and lifted. Aeon Shi could never have done it by himself, but Garon's earth-cast arms were strong. With a loud grunt, he heaved the iron framework up. 
It wobbled for a moment, then came crashing down on one of the spine backs, pinning it. A stream of acid washed across the platform. Geron's right leg vanished out from under him, leaving only frothing purple goo. He screamed and tumbled backwards into space. The final spine back, which still had Aeon Shi's improvised fighting staff protruding from its side, opened its jaws wide to snatch up this tasty treat. Aeon Shi launched himself off the back of the dais. He tackled Garon in mid-air, knocking him clear. They hit the sand together and rolled for some distance before coming to rest. Aeon Shi looked up in time to see the dais crash into a wall. Acrid smoke was belching from the undercarriage. He couldn't see whether Bentu was still alive or not. Aeon Shi stood despite his shaking knees. The final spine back was circling around. Its head was low. Its tail whipped back and forth. The crowd was chanting, Tanash, Tanash, Tanash. He had lost a significant amount of blood, despite his makeshift bandage. Colours swam at the edge of his vision. Sweat dripped from his forehead. If this was going to end, then it had to be now. I'll be fine, he told himself. His charge took the spine back by surprise. As it turned its head to the side guardedly, and she leapt through the air. He extended his hoof and drove it straight into the creature's eye. It exploded with a sharp cracking sound, covering his leg with ruptured jelly. The beast reared up and howled. Aonshi recovered himself, planted his injured leg in the sand, and kicked again with all his might. He caught the spine back square in the stomach, driving it backwards into an acid stream. Its head and neck dissolved. What remained of the body crashed down before him, vomiting forth blood and organs. The audience cheered. Aonshi hobbled over to the corpse and yanked the metal bar free. The hex cage in which he had entered was being lowered from the ceiling, and additional slaves were running out onto the field to begin cleaning up for the next event. He stood and watched as they gathered up Geron and hauled Bentu's limp body from off the platform. When they had been taken out through the main entryway, he stepped into the hex cage. The door swung shut, and he began to rise up once more. His performance finished for the time being. It wasn't long before Serene came to see him again. By that time, attendants had stitched his leg wound closed and applied foul-smelling salves everywhere else. She leered at him. Lara sana yajel shuthokas nikiluka, she said. A moment later, her brooch translated her words as, I had a feeling you'd join in the fun. I'm fighting for survival, and she replied tersely. Not entertainment. Serene pouted her lips and said, It's adorable. You still think there's a difference. They stared at each other a moment. What did the Master of Revels think? Aeon Shi asked. Serene's eyes hardened. Sidek thought it was fine. Let's just say he won't be closing me down any time soon. As long as you did not give him a reason to, that is. You must be hungry, Serene said, abruptly changing the subject. I'll have food brought to you. My friends as well. Her lips twisted in a sly smirk. A bit of celebratory fun with your underlings, eh? I thought as much. She snapped her fingers. Garon and Bentu were shoved through the door. Like Aeon Shi, their wounds had also been tended to. The overseer had been fitted with a metal prosthesis. I'll leave you to it, she said. Before leaving, she paused dramatically in the doorway and added, You two owe him your lives. Be sure to treat him well. No one spoke for some time. Finally, Garon broke the silence. I know I should thank you for saving us, Owen, he said. But perhaps you shouldn't have. Would not death be better than a life of slavery? I had thought that very thing, and she answered. However, I now realize that our duty to one another doesn't end just because we're no longer in the Empire. No matter where we go, the greater good is our strength and shield. Even here? Bentu asked weakly. He laid a hand on each of their shoulders. 
especially here. Someday, somehow, he told himself, I will bring the righteous fury of our people down on the heads of the Vasindar. From now until then, that is all I will strive for. Do not worry, he reassured them. I am Eun. I will lead and protect you. Always. What a sad, sad story. I'm not sure whether that's like actually like grim dark. <laughs> well, maybe it is, but uh, it's just sad. I mean, um, thank you to the people in the comments on the uh, the last video I did on the defense of Violasa. I forgot what it's called. Anyway, where it was Eon Shi fighting a defense that's what where he became sort of famous within the empire. I didn't know he had this story attached to him. I didn't know there was any additional lore. I, th I thought they just I thought they just stopped making the model. You get me? I thought they'd just stop making the model. <laughs> and there you go. It was just one of them one of them special characters that's disappeared to the lost to the depths of time, you know, as sometimes happens, yeah, with um Warhammer stuff. But uh yeah, this was a, a proper it was a heartbreaking little story. And you know what I like about it? Because it starts off and you're like, Oh, we're gonna find something interesting out about Farsight. And especially when this was written, um the Farsight stuff hadn't really changed since the stuff other than what was in the Codex explaining that it happened. I don't think Phil Kelly had written his novels yet. Um, like, I don't think Blades of Damocles had been released yet. So we didn't really know much about Farsight other than some little bits in the Codexes. So to have this at the time would have been, you know, it would have been so frustrating. <laughs> you would have been really annoyed. You read this, you're like, ooh, Farsight, what's going on? Because everybody loves Farsight and the Farsight ain't clubs. Come on, everybody does. Um, everybody. And... Uh, you read this, and, and then all of a sudden, Dark Eldar appeared and just enslaved this this poor <laughs> this poor Aeon. He was like a frontline Aeon. He's not like in the top pinnacles of the Tau society. He's been sent on a job, and it's kind of a propaganda job. It, they might, the might the the, the 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 ethereal council might genuinely think it might work, but I think it was just like a, a spying mission more than anything. That's why they sent this big ship. Um, yeah. <laughs> it's such a shame. I bet he wish he took his bodyguards with him now, hadn't he? I bet he wishes that. Because that was silly. <laughs> Why wouldn't you just take him here? What's the problem? Um, What a gun. <laughs> just take a gun. <laughs> anyway, I hope you enjoyed this. This was a great thing. And again, thank you to the people in the comments who replied. Uh, you, A couple of you mentioned like, ah, oh, I mean, someone mentioned, I can't remember who it was. I can't find it now. Um, Someone said, oh, it's a shame. He shouldn't have ended up in Kimura. And I'm like, what? Well, I saw that come up. I haven't gone through the... I haven't replied to everything yet, but um, I saw that comment and I was like, hang on, what? And I went and... I don't like going on Wikipedia because I generally don't need to, to be honest. <laughs> you know what I mean? I don't need to. I keep up with everything. And I've read a lot of like, the original stuff. Um, so I generally don't have to, but this one slipped by me. Yeah, anything from like 2010 through to like 2016, it's it's a bit grey of a grey area for me, unless it's something I've gone back and looked at specifically because... I was kind of out of the hobby, you know, I was being a normie and pretending to be a normal person and not into plastic crack and um, science fiction stories about esoteric gods and demons and uh, planets getting blown up by legions of genetically modified soldiers, you know, that sort of thing. Um, so I didn't really, there's a gap there in my knowledge with some bits and bobs and this is one of them things that slipped past me. So cool little find. Um, yeah, good stuff. Anyway. No more Tau stuff for a little bit. <laughs> We've been a bit Tau heavy on the channel, but there will be some Tau stuff shortly because I'm going to do a big Farsight video and a big Tau Empire video. Um, but I'm just reading some stuff at the minute what, about what to include. Research. Um, but yes, yeah, some uh, some good old-fashioned Space Marine stuff coming up soon. So stay tuned for that. Thank you to everybody supporting the channel. Um, you guys are really, you guys are the big help for me and I really, really appreciate it um, as channel members and or as supporters on Patreon. Um, and if you want to do that, you'll get your name added to the roll call of honour that's swirling past as I babble. Thank you again. Really, really appreciate it. And if you could help, I'd appreciate it. But if you can't do that, please do like the video. That massively helps uh, my channel. Um, and uh, comment as well. Let me know in the comments what you think. All these things really help the channel grow. Uh, you know, the, the the gods of the algorithm, it, um, it gets their attention. So I really appreciate that. And uh, I'll be back again with more stuff very, very soon. Big Space Marine video on its way. All right. See you later. Ta-ra. Bye-bye. For the greater good. Yeah? Are we saying Space King now? No, the greater good. The greater. For the greater good. <laughs>